tentacles got a lot larger and lasted a lot longer than most Ponzi perpetrators do. But at the end of the day, it was the same thing. He couldn't find enough cash fast enough to cover his obligations. Madoff told his victims that he had a secret strategy to buy and sell stocks at just the right time. In fact, he wasn't using his victims' money to buy and sell at all. But no one suspected anything because Madoff also ran a separate and legitimate division of his firm here in the Lipstick Building. In this part of the business, he acted as a stockbroker, known in Wall Street as a broker-dealer, buying and selling shares on behalf of outside clients. It was the perfect cover. Trader Ed Nickel agreed to give Willard an insight into the man he's known for almost 30 years. Madoff began as an upstart broker dealing shares in direct competition to the big boys. When I first met Bernie, he was an innovator. He realized that he could use technology to compete with the specialists on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. You see, the specialists on the floor traded uh, stocks uh, for their own accounts, and they did it by hand, which took minutes, sometimes uh, 10, 20 minutes to execute, where Bernie would execute a trade, sometimes in seconds. So what did the guys who were down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange at the time think about this? Well, they hated him. But Madoff the Outsider transformed himself to become part of the Wall Street establishment. He even rose to become chairman of the giant Nasdaq market, the busiest stock exchange in the world. Did you like Bernie? No. <laughs> no, Bernie, nor Bernie didn't like me either. We were competitors, but I never thought that he was an out-and-out -out crook. And a crook of this, of, of, of this enormous scale. At the moment, nobody really knows just how enormous, but some estimates have suggested that Madoff may have stolen as much as $64 billion. We'll take years of forensic accounting to find out, because what you'll have is uh, angry investors uh, claiming losses that are based on illusory profits and illusory account values that never really existed. The real amount may be some 25, 30 billion. Now this is still a lot of money, a huge amount of money, and, and will make his swindle the largest in U.S. history by a long stretch. It's difficult to get your head around such mind-boggling amounts of money. Just to give you an idea, what I've got here is a hundred dollar bill. It's about 65 pounds. Now, if you lay these out in front of the lipstick building, one by one on top of each other, the stack will be 70 times taller than that building before you even get to the low amount of what Madoff stuff. How on earth did Madoff persuade people to part with that kind of money? By being exclusive, that's how. You know, Groucho Marx said, I'd never want to be a member of a club that, that I could get into. Um, and I think sort of Bernie took that philosophy to the nth degree by creating himself as a, an exclusive club, right? Everybody wanted to get in, and so if you got in, you felt lucky. So, you know, don't, you knew you couldn't ask any questions. He would say to people, I don't want to take all your money today. I want you to become comfortable with me. So he would say, let's just, let's just date for now, and you give me a little bit of money, and then eventually we'll get married. And before you knew it, everybody wanted to be a part of Madoff's investments. I mean, you hear the stories about people literally trying to join the clubs that he was involved with so they could meet him. Clubs in places like this. This is the island of Palm Beach in Florida. This is where everyone who's anyone from New York has their winter holiday home. Including Madoff and it's got the retail therapy to match. Palm Beach was the perfect place for Bernie's scam. Not just because it's got more millionaires per square inch than almost anywhere on Earth, but because so many of them are Jewish. Almost every Ponzi scheme begins as what's called an affinity crime. The rifter selects marks from his own community. In Bernie's case, they were Jewish. And many of them were members of the very upmarket Palm Beach Country Club. 
Palm Beach itself, it's sharply divided between Jews and non-Jews, unfortunately. So there's quite a bit of anti-Semitism, I suppose you would call it, uh, in Palm Beach itself. There has been for years. In the 50s, Jews couldn't get into the local country club, so they started their own. Today, the dress code is very smart casual. You can wear shorts at the Palm Beach Country Club, but no higher than four inches above the knee. The uh, initiation fee, uh, I believe, is now about $300,000. Secondly, uh, in order to get uh, into the club, they really want to see that you're giving uh, uh, as much away in charity, uh, certainly, as the cost of the membership. So the club contained just the sort of person Madoff needed. Pretty soon, he had millionaires here by the dozen queuing up to invest with him. And it's thought a third of the members fell victim. I happened to be uh, down there uh, that week, and I remember going into uh, the dining room to have lunch before I played golf. And uh, there were maybe a dozen people in the dining room. Hardly anybody was there. And the people that were there looked like they had gotten hit in the face with a frying pan. One Madoff victim, who is a country club member, also happens to be the man who's probably lost more than anyone else from Britain. He invested in the classic Madoff way, through connections here. I asked to see the, some returns of how they had performed over the 10 years. The returns were not amazing, but they were very consistent. And I decided that this was a safe investment. It did cross my mind that it could be a Ponzi scheme, but there were certain elements to it which did not fit with that. The first was the return was very modest. The figures are too, too low. Secondly, Ponzi schemes blow themselves out because they've got to bring in huge new investors all the time. And with four or five years, they're usually busted. And usually the, the uh, guy who started them has fled. But the man behind it, wasn't fleeing anywhere. Bernie Madoff was clever enough to be low-key rather than flashy, but he continued to have a home here, hidden discreetly behind these palm trees. Bernie Madoff himself was a quiet man, not, in certainly in Palm Beach terms, ostentatious, lived quite quietly, did have some of the trappings of wealth, but did nothing exceptional, tended to keep himself to himself. For Willard, it's fascinating to find any clues about what makes Madoff tick. Well, this is the first time I've actually been able to come up and uh, actually touch one of Madoff's properties. But, uh, well, but you can look inside and you can see it's obviously very nicely decorated and everything we've been hearing about his taste is very much true. You know, it's very understated, very quiet. But I think the one thing that really shouts out to me about this place is if you look around, it's like a jungle. All the other houses around here, they're big and they're wide and they're open and they're showing their wealth. But Madoff's house is just, it's hidden away and you know, it's set back and it's much smaller than all the others and it's much less ostentatious. It's almost like the man himself, you know, he's wealthy but he doesn't want to show it off. Madoff has four homes and this was just the first to be seized. If you come down here, you can actually look right into the kitchen. And I think one of the sort of slightly chilling things about coming to this house is if you look in, you can actually see, you know, kids' pictures on the fridge. It's like, it's like the Marie Celeste. It's like they've just walked out. With so many Madoff victims concentrated in one place, it's hardly surprising that some of them are feeling the pinch a bit. But one man's loss is another man's gain. This Picasso etching worth $10,000 could be yours for three. This beautiful Tahitian pearl necklace with the 18 karat diamond clasp, normally $60,000, could be yours for a mere $22,500. This Maserati Gran Turismo is $134,000, but can be yours for barely a hundred. It's no longer Florida's high season, but the street containing the most exclusive boutiques, Worth Avenue, yes, it's really called Worth Avenue, is still very quiet. The Madoff victims around here are a bit too posh to hold a yard sale, of course, but they've still got to offload their luxury items and fast. Over here, we have a 
200 piece set of uh, cutlery, sterling silver flatware. This auction house even organized a special sale for the goods of Madoff's victims. But if they're selling their flatware, then it's sort of the end of the line. They're liquidating everything they can to be able to have money to live. And now they're down to plastic forks and, uh, and knives. And I hope napkins. All the pieces you're looking at right now have all come from uh, Madoff victims. Actually, one of my favorite pieces is the one that I'm wearing. There's over 91 carats of diamonds, and uh, the regular price was probably around 250000 And we're selling it for about 95000 The number of customers that we have who have personal losses with Madoff uh, is frightening. Uh, the evidence is there because they continue to come in and plead with us to uh, give them more for their cars. Many people come into the store and specifically ask, where's your Madoff jewelry? And you know, as they snicker, and they're very much like vultures. People are embarrassed for the first time. People who live in these homes have never had a need to be embarrassed. But Willard knows that at least the Madoff victims in Palm Beach can pick up the pieces and go on living their lives. That chance has gone for his father. As I've learned more about Bernie Madoff, I've also learned a lot more about my father. Some of the things have made me really proud. For example, at his funeral, some of his comrades from over the years, anything up to a major general, was talk were talking to me about how brave and how honorable he was and how proud they were to have known him. I can't imagine any of Bernie's friends will be saying that at his funeral. Certainly not many from Madoff's own community. Whether they fell victim or not, He's humiliated them all. I happen to be Jewish, and I think this is a terrible disgrace for the Jewish people, that uh, one of our own uh, could uh, uh, do this uh, to, uh, to our own. Um, this is a behavior which is uh, uh, just so anti-ethical to what the uh, uh, Jewish principles uh, are or should be, uh, that uh, I think we're all very, very embarrassed about it. I, th I just thought, um I, was, I thought it was astounding, and, and as, as the details emerged, I, I found it even more astounding that he had um, so cannibalized his community. But Madoff didn't stop with the Jewish community in places like this, or on the East Coast. He needed more money, and plenty of it. Go west, young man. Where better to go than California? And that's Willard's next stop. Madoff's marks here included some of the biggest names in Hollywood. Steven Spielberg, John Malkovich, and Kevin Bacon. And on the day that Oscar-winning screenwriter Eric Roth found he'd been nominated for a Golden Globe, he discovered he also lost money to Madoff. And he's not the only victim of unfortunate timing around here. The author of this new book is a world expert on gullibility and why some people are easier to fool than others. I held the first copy in my hand on uh, December 10th, and two days later, on December 12th, I'd learned that I'd lost money in the Madoff scandal. And, you know, on one level, it's funny, uh, but that irony was appealing to a lot of people, and, and basically, brought up the question, how could a smart person, in this case a person who knows something about gullibility, be taken in? Any human being not living in a cave by himself can be swindled or, or duped. I lost uh, about $400,000. Although $400,000 is a lot of money, it's small change to the Palm Beach and Hollywood set. But as the scam grew, Madoff needed to rely less on a few super rich and more on thousands of less prosperous people. People like Ian Tierman. You'd think by the time you're 90, you'd have earned the right to a happy and prosperous retirement. And Ian had one. Till Bernie Madoff stole all his money. Now he's had to go back to work at the local supermarket to help make ends meet. The very fact that I'm earning $10 an hour rather than nothing uh, makes an enormous difference at the end of the week. And uh, it is so difficult at a time like this 
the very fact that they offered me this job as sort of the receptionist uh, here uh, and talking about the excellent quality of their food uh, it was a challenge, but 